Sevalod Padovkin was a Soviet director, screenwriter, and actor. He was one of the great innovators in the early days of film, but his name is virtually unknown to anyone outside of film school. When he was 25, Padovkin planned to study chemistry and physics, but after seeing D.W. Griffith's Intolerance, he became inspired to study film instead at the State Institute of Cinematography in Moscow. At that time, film was still a very young art form, and ideas and techniques that are commonplace today were just being developed. Padovkin was a director and actor, but I think his most influential role in the world of cinema came from his theories on editing. Padovkin noted that editing is an aspect of film art form which is completely unique from all other art forms. The effect you can get from juxtaposing different shots together in a film is unlike anything else in literature, music, theater, or photography. He also understood that editing is not merely a way to string the shots together that make up a scene, which he called structural editing, but rather it's a method of guiding the thoughts and emotional responses of the viewer, which he called relational editing. Editing can be a way of creating visual metaphors or a way of suggesting a relationship between two seemingly unrelated shots. Padovkin even went so far as to say that the emotional content of a scene comes more from proper editing technique than it does from the performance of the actor. He gave five examples of relational editing that could be used to, as he put it, control the psychological guidance of a spectator in essence, conveying an emotion or idea without explicitly saying it. The five editing techniques are contrast, parallelism, symbolism, simultaneity, and leitmotif. Let's take a look at some examples from more recent films. By cutting from one shot to a drastically different shot, a film editor can force the viewer to compare two opposing scenes in their mind. Michael Francis Rizzi, do you renounce Satan? I do renounce him. In Francis Ford Coppola's film The Godfather, there is a scene near the end where Michael Corleone is attending the christening of his nephew. At the same time this is going on, he has ordered his men to kill the heads of the other New York crime families. I do renounce them. The film cuts back and forth between the sacred ritual going on in the church and the murders going on around the city. Even as Michael renounces the devil, his men are gunning people down. The contrast between these two scenarios helps to illustrate just how far Michael is willing to go and the depths of his hypocrisy and deceitfulness. Michael Rizzi, will you be baptized? In nomine Patris, et Filii, et Spiritus Sancti. Michael Rizzi, Go in peace, and may the Lord be with you. Amen. Perhaps one of the most famous cuts that uses contrast is in Stanley Kubrick's 2001, A Space Odyssey. The film shows a bone, the primitive tool of an ape man, flying through the air, and then cuts to a space station. While similar in shape and size, the juxtaposition of these two shots again forces the spectator to consider just how much mankind has evolved over the years. Parallelism is a way of connecting two scenes visually by matching certain elements within the scene. Martin Scorsese uses parallelism in Hugo to make a connection between the inner mechanics of a clock and the mechanics of 1930s Paris. Often. Parallelism is used to jump from one time period or location to another in a more elegant way. Steven Spielberg does a cut like this in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. The film cuts from a young Indiana Jones and jumps forward in time 26 years to Indiana Jones at a much later date. There is another example of parallelism in The Lost World. The movie jumps from a shot of a woman screaming
to Jeff Goldblum yawning on a train platform as train brakes screech in the background. Incidentally, this cut is almost certainly an homage to Alfred Hitchcock's The 39 Steps, which features an almost identical cut. In Strangers on a Train, Hitchcock used parallelism when cutting back and forth between the feet of two strangers walking on a train platform. who these two men are yet, but the way the film is cut suggests that they will somehow be tied together before too long, that there's some sort of relationship between the two of them. One of the most famous cuts of all times is a symbolic cut. In Lawrence of Arabia, T.E. Lawrence is trying to convince an officer that he should be allowed to go out to the desert. The man warns him and tells him just how hot and dangerous the desert can be. T.E. Lawrence holds up a match, and as he blows it out, the film cuts to a shot of the sun rising on the desert horizon. Lawrence, only two kinds of creature get fun in the desert, Bedouins and gods, and you're neither. Take it from me. For ordinary men, it's a burning, fiery furnace. No, Dryden. It's going to be fun. It is recognized that you have a funny sense of fun. <sighs> the juxtaposition of these two shots underscores the fiery heat and harshness of the desert environment. Both Martin Scorsese and Steven Spielberg have specifically mentioned this cut in interviews as being a very influential moment in their development as filmmakers. In Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho, there is a cut that goes from blood flowing down a bathtub drain to the eye of Janet Lee's murdered character. This cut literalizes the metaphor of a life down the drain. Simultaneity is also called cross-cutting. I think the most famous example of this would be in The Silence of the Lambs. The movie cuts back and forth from a SWAT team preparing to storm the house of the serial killer Buffalo Bill while he is inside racing around trying to rescue his dog from the woman he's been holding prisoner. And you don't know what pain is! The scene ends when the SWAT team rings the doorbell. At this point, we realize the cross-cutting has actually been a red herring. The SWAT team is at the wrong house, and FBI agent Clarice Starling is at the front door of the murderer all alone. This throws the viewer completely off, as one minute you think the killer is about to be captured, and in the next minute the situation is completely reversed and the lead actress is in extreme danger. Excuse me, sir. Um, I really need to speak with you. Clear! Clear! You, you, what's the problem, officer? Well, I'm investigating the death of Frederica Bimmel. There's no one here, Jack. Clarice. Late motif is usually used as a musical term. It describes a recurring musical phrase associated with a particular person, place, or idea. Think of the Indiana Jones theme. Or the Emperor's March in Star Wars. In this case, though, 
Rodovkin is using it in a visual sense, describing a recurring shot or scene that has some sort of meaning or symbolism. In the case of Spielberg's Jaws, the late motif of the underwater point of view shot was used. Every time you see this underwater shot, you know that the shark is nearby and could attack at any moment. In High Noon, the leitmotif of the clock is shown over and over, making the viewer aware of how time is running out and how desperately Gary Cooper needs to find an ally before it's too late. Rodovkin's theories on editing were extremely influential. They were influential during his life, but they continue to be foundational for generations of filmmakers after him. Next time you're watching a movie, keep an eye open for these different editing techniques. It will give you clues about what the filmmaker is trying to say, as well as a better appreciation for visual storytelling. I'm Evan Richards. Thanks for watching.